Good morning to everybody. It's a great pleasure to open this long-awaited uh, webinar on COP15, uh, Outcomes, Way Forward, and uh, Future Actions. We have a very dense agenda for today, so without further ado, let me give the floor to our uh, co-presidency, the EU and Jordan co-presidency. <coughs> So please uh, close your microphone um, if you're not uh, directly uh, speaking. So uh, let me give the floor to Mr. Davor Perkan, the head of unit of the Regional and Bilateral Environmental Cooperation at DG Environment. So Mr. Perkan, Davor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandra. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, good, morning to, uh, good morning to everyone. And uh, together with uh, Jordan as, uh, as co-president of the UFM, I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the European Commission to, to this webinar. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the UFM for organizing this event in follow-up to CBD COP15, a meeting that uh, took place uh, in December of last year. The uh, Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework is the fruit of four years of tough negotiations and represents a breakthrough for biodiversity conservation and restoration and its sustainable use. It complements the Paris Agreement and together uh, they form a global roadmap towards sustainable development. Uh, getting there will nevertheless mean transformative change of our society and economy within a very short uh, time. Um, the effective and full implementation of the global biodiversity framework is urgent. It requires active engagement of all government, uh, all society and all of the economy. Uh, it also uh, requires mobilization of resources from all sources and will need continued effort and leadership. Uh, the global biodiversity framework is not a pick and choose menu, but needs to be implemented in its uh, entirety. In the EU, we recognize that implementation is a major challenge in a time when uh, many other priorities are occupying uh, leaders' agendas and minds. However, the uh, global biodiversity crisis emergency that we are currently facing will not go away. Uh, it is likely to get worse and it will get worse fast unless we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and uh, work to protect our and protect and restore our ecosystems. Um, just uh, this weekend, uh, the adoption of a new UN treaty uh, on the high seas, including with the target of placing 30% of the world's oceans uh, and protecting them and placing them and protecting them and, and designating, them, designating them as protected areas is a very positive uh, step to, to address that. And we in the EU are committed to working together with other parties and the stakeholders on the various follow-up processes um, from uh, COP15. And we welcome this event as an important opportunity to highlight the key elements of the new global biodiversity framework and the next steps that we will all need to take uh, to implement uh, its goals. And in this, uh, uh, with this, I, I wish you uh, a successful and, and fruitful uh, meeting and once again, uh, greet you all. Thank you. And Alessandra, over, over to you. Many thanks, Adawar, for this important opening uh, messages and reflections. I will now pass the floor to our Jordan co-presidency to Mr. Abdallah Zhu, the Director, Assistant and Head of Policies and Strategy at the Ministry of Environment of Jordan. So Mr. Zhu, Abdallah, the floor is yeah. yours. Thank you, Alessandra. I hope you're hearing me well. Very well. Uh, dear President and estimated colleagues, dear participants, it is my greatest pleasure to open this timely and strategic webinar on the outcomes and follow up to the CBD COP15 in the Euro-Mediterranean region, almost coinciding with the historic approved 
approval at UN headquarters in New York two days ago of the historic agreement to protect our oceans belonging around two decades of the invitations. The new high seas, seas ocean treaty, which follow the last international agreement on ocean protection, was signed four years ago in 1982. The UN Convention on the law of the sea is crucial for the conversing the theory by theory pledge made by countries at the UN Biodiversity Conference, Conserve, your Biodiversity Conference in the December. To protect third of the sea and land by 2030, within a 30, this target will, would be almost impossible to reach. It will be extremely important to start addressing it within the UFM context, uh, as this will imply joint efforts at country level, including environment and for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs side. Go back to long-awaited a global biodiversity framework agreement, which will be guided by biodiversity policy in the coming years. The UFM countries, the 43 countries are making their utmost to respond to the needs of the plant and our region. In welcoming you as Jordan co-president, I would like to recall that the ministers from the 43 members countries of the Union of the Mediterranean gathered on the 4th of October 2021 in Cairo for the second UFM ministerial conference on environment and climate action. They agreed on common agenda for strengthening offers at the Euro material level to urgently tackle that multiple climate and environment challenges our region faces. This second UFM ministerial conference came at the article, a critical moment of the Mediterranean, which as we are, we will aware. A global climate change hot this foot wearing 20% faster than a global average. And a world would recognized by diversity with this foot surfing of alarming by diversity loss retail. Around but reactive to such urgent and impossible this decision to talk. The, the 43 UFM countries have been very active during the recent invitation at COP27, uh, COP15, as well as in the framework together, framework of the global 30 under negotiation, the end the to the plastic pollution and link interlinking to the limited the average global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees above their industrial levels. The UF and UN and Jordan co-presidency and secretary are not only committed but highly operative and active to support the implementation of the project of the 2021 UFM Ministerial Declaration of the Environment and the Climate Action in the Mediterranean region through the so-called Green Mid Agenda with the main objective of the co coordination offers to the technical and financial level. In the clause in the with this UF Ministerial Declaration and COP to 15 target the Mediterranean region it's promoting and many exploratory action which are directly contributing to the CBD 15 target leading with with the way and reflecting the highest, highest possible level and uh, ambition by uh, accelerating of the transition towards fair a special thank you guys goes to the EU and other bilateral donors that are making financial efforts to support this work and the UFM secretary for this robot and trade and tested multi-stockholder approach, which has again a growth. Today, country representative UFM secretary colleagues and stakeholder will report it in more details how to discuss of the COP15 are being implemented and how are we we are giving uh, uh, essentially a bust that this offers in term in regional project and process.
dear colleagues with this, I wish you a very fruitful webinar. Thank you. Many thanks, Abdallah, for linking uh, to the UFM uh, work, introducing that. So we now give the floor to our Deputy Secretary General, Deputy Secretary General of the Division on uh, uh, Water Environment and Blue Economy at the UFM. So Mr. Abadi, Almotaz, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandra, and uh, all our great colleagues from the Secretariat of Union for the Mediterranean for a really great job that you are doing together with the UF AMCO presidency from EU and Jordan. Thank you very much for uh, all the guidance that you gave us in your opening remark for the Union for the Mediterranean, as you know that we are working together in order to build a coherent approach between the region, the Union for the Mediterranean region, as well as the global agendas here Today, we are going to focus on the uh, CBD, the COP15, and beyond all the commitment that international community, including G2G, B2B, all actors and multi-stakeholder process that they commit themselves in order to help alleviate the biodiversity problems around the globe, especially on the Mediterranean, as you know. The Union for the Mediterranean is around a basin that is really suffering from all angles. When it comes to the social context, economic integration, as well as the environmental pressure caused by different human activities around the Mediterranean and the maritime transport, as well as the biggest influence of the climate change in our region, which take different shape, including the high temperature and storm flood, as well as, as you know, the sea level rise. All of these elements require us to work on a, on a conducive agenda that let us work together and enhance the way that we are governed and manage our resources, especially when it comes to the water, environment aspects, blue economy and the green economy. All of these elements need to be tackled on a different approach. The way that we used to uh, manage our resources is no longer sustainable. So based on the declaration of the Union for the Mediterranean on different thematic area, including the environment, the climate change, ministerial declaration, blue economy and sustainable blue economy and the green economy declaration, and the water ministerial declaration urge the Union for the Mediterranean member state and partner in order to work and start shifting toward the sustainable production and consumption toward fair transition to green economy and circular economy, which require us to do two things here. The first one that the Union for the Mediterranean is trying to do is to build a coherent policy in interface in the Mediterranean region, respecting the specificity of each member state, but at the same time, the effort and the collective effort of cooperation among different member states, either South-South or North-North or North-South cooperation or triangular cooperation in the region shall be aiming to one objective. The objective is to do more by exerting less, as well as to enhance our a regulatory framework that govern all of these resources. And the most important part is the conducive whole government and whole society approach. And how we do this, we do this by giving the ownership to the member state, giving the ownership to you around the table, even virtually. But we are very happy that you will be leading today the discussion and bringing to us some recommendation that we can integrate on the cycle of planning uh, of planning of the Union for the Mediterranean work program, as well as to help our member state in order to put uh, a responsive uh, national development plan that take into in board those global commitment from biodiversity, climate change, as well as the integrated water resource management and the blue economy file. The second element that we believe putting this and designing this policy will lead uh, to uh, draw a roadmap toward uh, moving ahead in the right direction 
to implement this uh, virtue in the biodiversity convention, but also it requires uh, an effort that capacitate our member state in order to have the right capacity uh, to respond to this commitment. And this uh, capacity development take two shape, either by mobilizing some technical assistant in order to develop a guiding document or monitoring a framework to uh, monitor the level of implementation of this commitment around the Mediterranean and to come out with a narrative that will give some kind of comparison where we failed, where we have been successful. Uh, with this uh, technical assistant, as you know, or training, capacity development, uh, and giving gu guidance to the member state how to develop a project that responds to the commitment on the biodiversity or to the uh, Paris Declaration on Climate Change, we notice that this need to be final, finally uh, to complete the loop, to focus on the issue related to the water, to the financial and investment aspects on the Mediterranean. And when it comes to the financial and investment strategies of the Union for the Mediterranean, it's not only about putting more resources. We work with our member state, uh, either the beneficiary country or with the Development Cooperation Agency and International Financial Institute to work on a balanced approach by putting some resources in the region. But the most important thing is how to make these resources sustainable in terms of building facilities and make the uh, blended of finance between three things, the government own resources, the donor community resources and the lending of uh, different IFIs, coupling it with the most important uh, factor that will support the uh, tr fair transition toward circular economy and the green blue economy is to engage the private sector either on the term of investment, B BOT or whatsoever uh, model but also the most important factor in, or, in order to uh, make the biodiversity uh, a sector, uh, sorry, an, an issue that we want to respond to protect the biodiversity as well as to harness on the biodiversity framework in order to enhance the socioeconomic reality, the role of entrepreneurials and the role of uh, shifting toward building a community of a practice on the issue related to the circular economy, green uh, jobs and employment is also a key to the Union for the Mediterranean. So I would like to call upon you today in order to give us some recommendation and what you need in terms of bolstering the job and employment while protecting the biodiversity and protecting our natural heritage around the Mediterranean because it is alarming. The situation is, is very dangerous. We receive a lot of uh, figures that we need to shift the way that we are dealing with our great heritage and the great sea in the Mediterranean. And this region needs to also advance a key and unified message into uh, implementing the biodiversity framework toward achieving the sustainable development goal at a global level. With this, I would like to thank you again, Alessandra and my colleague from the co-presidency and the team. And we give the floor back to you because you own the floor and we will be waiting what you agree on to put it on the next planning of our efforts. Thank, thank you, you very much, very much uh, Mr. Abadi. And thank you very much, uh, colleagues, for these uh, extensive opening remarks. Uh, we move now fast towards the first uh, session on the overview of the main outcomes of COP15. We're very pleased, actually, to have uh, two key members of the negotiating teams, uh, both from the European side and the Jordan side. So without further ado, let me give the floor to Mr. Anteo Sainan from DG Environment until the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and, and good morning to everybody. I'm very happy to be here in this important um, uh, webinar um, because it lets me underline biodiversity in the Mediterranean and around the Mediterranean. And it's incredibly important for both the, the African side as well as the European side. Um, we had agreed well, I, with uh, Mr. Ktishat 
uh, sharing of the different topics, um, but I'm not entirely sure whether we would do it alternating in the order of the framework or not, but let me start and then uh, hand over uh, and then see how to continue. Perhaps first of all, then an overview of the COP, the aims and the process. Uh, first of all, biodiversity, what is it? It's all life on Earth, natural ecosystems and wild species, as well as managed ecosystems and cultivated species. Uh, biodiversity has dimensions on at the level of ecosystems, populations, uh, species, uh, genetic diversity. It's, it, of course, it has its intrinsic value when you see beautiful landscape, the animals, it has a value in itself, but it's also incredibly important for food, fiber, building materials, etc. Half the economy is heavily or moderately dependent on biodiversity. And let's not forget the regulatory functions. Biodiversity and ecosystems are crucial for climate change mitigation and adaptation. Without healthy ecosystems, it's impossible to achieve the one and a half degrees. And it's an interdependence. Also, biodiversity is affected and dependent on climate. Um, biodiversity is important for disaster risk reduction, but also health. Uh, it's linked to COVID and pandemics. So just to underline, and I think everybody who was in, in December was very much aware of the importance of getting a good framework. Um, the background is, is actually not so good. Uh, the Millennium Goals in 2010, we found out they were not achieved. And then there were, we were agreeing on IG targets in Nagoya. Uh, but despite the efforts, increased efforts, none of the IG biodiversity targets agreed in 2010 have been achieved in full because basically the pressures on biodiversity increased even stronger. So we do have to do it differently. And that's why in 2018 at CBD COP14, a decision was taken on the preparatory process. Two co-chairs were appointed, Mr. Francis Ockwell from Uganda and Basile van Havre from Canada to, to steer a party-led process. And we had five rounds of negotiations in the open-ended working group uh, and the last one was directly before COP. Obviously the whole process uh, took more time also because of the COVID pandemic. Altogether we've been working on this more than four years. It's important to realize that this is really a package. Uh, the 2050 vision was actually already agreed uh, and that everybody agreed it should stay but we needed to clarify what it actually means. And that is now uh, reflected in four goals for 2050, outcome-oriented goals. Um, there's a 2030 mission and then 2030, 23 action-oriented targets. Uh, but that's not all. We also have a monitoring framework, mechanisms for review of implementation, decisions on financing, ABS, access and benefit sharing, notably in the light of digital sequence information, DSI, and decision on capacity building. All of that was one package where all parties then agreed upon. Finally, also important to uh, stress, the, the framework covers the three objectives of the CBT in a balanced manner. So it's about conservation, as well as sustainable use, and the fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising from the utilization of genetic resources. And uh, the final introductory remark, um, we had a COP, the CBD COP, but there were also the, uh, the meetings of the parties under the protocols of the CBD. So the CBD protocol on biosafety, the Cartagena protocol, and the Nagoya protocol on benefit sharing. All of that happened in parallel and all those decisions are quite important as well. So these are the introductory remarks. Um, so now the question is whether we would continue first with goal A with Mr. Katishat or whether I should continue with goal B, targets 9 to 12. And if Mr. Katishat is not jumping in, perhaps then I'll continue with the parts that I would cover. Yeah, let me then continue with goal B. Um, goal B is about ecosystem services and sustainable use. Um, it's the 2050 outcomes. 
in this uh, goal, it's also about valuation, the valuation of the goals. Uh, there has been discussion also to have a link with the, the ecological footprint, but the footprint was chosen to be addressed rather in targets uh, uh, 14, 15, and 16. Continuing with targets 9 to 12, um, these are targets also about sustainable use and ecosystem services, so that, that's why they are linked. Um, target 9 is about the management and the use of wild species to make sure it is sustainable. This actually has a strong link with target five, which is a focus on over-exploitation. But in this target, there's more of focus on benefits, uh, including through the promoting of sustainable biodiversity-based activities and products and services that enhance biodiversity. Um, and then it's good to uh, realize that the definition of biodiversity-based activities, products and services is really very broad, but it's important that this is also qualified as sustainable uh, activities and that enhance biodiversity. Um, it's also the placement in the target, it's a bit ambiguous because it's biodiversity based products, obviously, is not only based on wild species, but also on uh, managed species and managed ecosystems. Let's see how this will work out in implementation. Um, target 10 is about the managed ecosystems. So it's about managing sustainably the areas under agriculture, aquaculture, fisheries, and forestries. Uh, these are actually the four sectors that are very much covered by the food and agriculture organizations, the FAO. Um, important here is also that there's an addition on biodiversity friendly practices. Uh, and there's been quite a bit of negotiations on, on which terms to include. And in the end, we all agreed on, on biodiversity friendly practices, including sustainable intensification, agroecological and other innovative approaches. Um, target 11 is about restoring, maintaining and enhancing nature's contributions to people, including ecosystem functions and services. Um, the, the target actually mentions uh, in particular various regulatory services like climate and health, um, and, and these are the services that over the past decades have been declining uh, very much, uh, where actually the provisioning services of food and, and fiber uh, have been increased to the detriment of the regulatory functions. And this targeting in, in, indicates that we should restore and maintain all of them and with a particular focus on the regulatory services. Target 12 is focusing on green and blue spaces, which is very much in, about urban biodiversity. And uh, it, it's in, in the world is increasingly urbanized and the population is growing. And in that context, actually urban biodiversity is increasingly important for well-being and for biodiversity itself. With that, let me continue with uh, ABS. Uh, access and benefit sharing. It's the third objective of the CBD. And uh, the background is that decades ago in the past, there have been examples of uh, biopiracy where scientists, companies went into forests and, and, and found plants, took them back home, made huge profits with it. And then the local population never saw any benefits. Uh, that had to be stopped. And that had been an issue for a long time. Uh, and in that context, in 2010, the Nagoya Protocol was uh, agreed to have a multilateral system where uh, actually on a bilateral basis, benefits could be shared between those, the users and, and the providers of genetic resources. Um, however, the feeling is that this system has not delivered. And one element in this context is that the rules were very much based on the physical uh, exchange of plants and genetic material. Whereas nowadays, a lot of information is actually put in an electronic form, right, in a, a DNA code, which can be shared by email. Uh, and the broader term here is digital sequence information. Uh, and, and there has uh, been a lot of uh, uncomfort discomfort with, with DSI undermining the fair sharing. And in that context, the CBD COP made really a very big step forward. Goal C uh, is about sharing the benefits of genetic resources 
and DSI. So, and that should be substantially increased. It also has reference to indigenous peoples and, and uh, traditional knowledge. And also it refers to uh, internationally agreed access and benefit sharing instruments. Target 13 for 2030 is to take effective legal policy, administrative and capacity building measures at levels, at all levels uh, for benefit sharing, again, for genetic, from genetic resources and also from digital sequence information. And here we should see a significant increase. Uh, there's also an important COP decision, uh, establishing a further process, well, establishing a multilateral mechanism for the benefit sharing from genetic resources and digital sequence information. Um, but then there's a process for further defining modalities. And, and uh, one of the dimensions here is, is that, well, who should be concerned? In our view, this should not focus only on, on government, but also on the private sector to foster their contribution and thereby also making the link to resource mobilization, financing, which is another key item. Um, then the final part I would do is about monitoring, reporting and review. Um, we, this different from the previous time, now we adopted a framework as well as a monitoring framework. In 2010, <clears throat> the IG targets were agreed, but it took six years before a monitoring framework had been further developed. And, and uh, now it has been much more strengthened and been really been uh, put in tune with the framework itself. And notably, there are 26 headline indicators, which all parties are expected to report on. These are indicators that can be added up so that these will allow a com uh, an overview of where we all stand together. Um, then there are also component and other indicators. And again, parties are encouraged to use as much as possible indicators that are commonly used for really having a good common overview. Um, the re national reports are actually due in February 2026 and then uh, June 2029. The second element in this framework is, is that we all recognize the important role of national biodiversity strategies and action plans, which is the key instrument for implementing the Convention on Biological Diversity. And everybody is uh, requested to align the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plans, the NBSAPs, with the framework by COP16. And COP16, it's the next COP, is expected in October uh, 2024. Um, for parties that cannot <clears throat> align their NBS up in time, they are still asked to uh, align national targets uh, with the, the framework and its goals and targets and submit that to the CBD again by COP16. And actually the COP adopted a template so that there's a standardized form that will allow for adding up comparability and thereby having a kind of an assessment and analysis of where we collectively stand in terms of ambition. And in a climate context, that's called a, a global gap report. A third element is, is actually an also a global analysis of where we stand with implementation. So not only the ambition, but also the actual implementation on the ground based on the national reports and on scientific evidence and any other uh, information that is relevant for that assessment in climate change terms that a, a stock take. Um, after that, that should be followed by a ratcheting up if that's needed. If we find that if we're not making enough progress, we should obviously do more. And that can concern an increase of ambition, so increasing national targets, or um, stepping up the actions to achieve the uh, targets that have been established. Uh, but to be honest, the COP and the framework is, is quite short and silent on this ratcheting up. Uh, two further elements, the voluntary country by country assessments. There's the voluntary peer review, which uh, I would warmly recommend. It's where a team of experts would visit a country to do a review with the country. Uh, and then there's the open-ended forum on implementation where uh, reports by the company are scrutinized and, and open for questions by a wider forum in the, the subsidiary body of implementation. Uh, the final element is here, non-state actors, really the 
important role of non-stated actors is recognized, they are also asked to contribute and then make commitments and uh, feed that into the uh, to convene action agenda for nature and people uh, and have transparent reporting on their implementation. Uh, all these elements are really uh, very important for making sure that we fully implement the framework. Um, let me stop here and then I leave the other topics. Yeah. My colleague, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sainan. In the meanwhile, we have got also Engineer Bilal uh, online, so we'll now take the floor to complement the picture. We see actually that Morocco asked to, um, to speak. Uh, we just asked to Morocco to wait a few minutes because we have intervention of Mr. Uh, Engineer Bilal uh, Kishak from Jordan. And then we will give you the floor if you will have to move to that meeting. We hope that this is acceptable to you. So, Mr. Kishas, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you for my friends. Uh, how are you? Uh, and congratulations for updating the framework. After four years, finally, we finished it. So I uh, thank you for your efforts during the last four years and kind of cooperation with the European Union during negotiation uh, during that time. Um, I, I will try to uh, make uh, share or from your side, you can make share. Yes, you can share your presentation, please do. Uh, I not have the option. Okay, if you have any problem, we oh, can... yes, yes, this is this is okay. Thank you. I find it. Fine. Yes, please proceed. Yes, we can see you. Okay. Uh, maybe the what I want to uh, talk about as uh, make version before it is to talk about uh, introduction uh, for uh, goals and uh, a and. Uh, other targets related it and mainstreaming, uh, capacity building, and resource mobilization. Uh, maybe the, this paragraph uh, is mentioned in a framework. Uh, this is very uh, important paragraph to keep uh, attention for that when we talk about an average of around 25% of a species is uh, assist animal and plant groups are is retained. Uh, around 1 million species already face extinction. So this is need from us uh, clear action and ambition action and clear cooperation to face this degradation we face. And if you see all this action is taken, we will lose that. And further acceleration in the global rate of species extinction, which is the most important and uh, high in ten, tens to hundreds of times higher than it uh, has averaged over the past 10 million years. This paragraph is from IBIS uh, out of fifth, fifth edition report for global biodiversity outlook, and it is put in a framework to see why we want to uh, work in this framework and how much is this framework is important and why take four years during negotiating and uh, to complete that process. So this action we needed to have the vision, which we adapted it, a world of living in harmony with nature. And for the above, we face a great challenge in achieving the vision and therefore need a clear cut mission that contribute to achieving the vision. 
the mission of the framework for the period up to 2030 towards the 2050 vision is to take urgent action to halt and uh, reverse biodiversity loss to put nature on, bath, on a path to recovery for the benefits of people and the planet by conserve, conserving and sustainably using biodiversity. Maybe this is the key words we're going to work on it, and that's what we want to have. The benefits which come from use of genetic resources, this is very important to can keep our uh, cover the implementation and cover needs of conservation in the future for all sectors in uh, framework. The framework consists of two levels. Now we have two levels of implementation. The first one is the uh, strategic or, or long-term goals. Uh, these goals extended to 2050, and the second level is target, which extended to 2030. So we need to make parallel between this and the framework until 2030 is to prepare or make recovery action to can reach the goals. Now, goal A is very important because it is talking about the first step of conservation. It is integrated connectivity and resilience of all ecosystem are maintained. This is our target. All uh, integrity and connectivity and resilience of ecosystem are maintained. Enhanced to restore sustainably increasing the areas of natural ecosystem by 2050. So the ecosystem or the habitat or the area for species is very important to can keep it, to can have Right, and the human and this extinction of non-threatened species is halted and by 2050 extinction rate and risk of all species are reduced tenfold and the uh, abundance of native wild species is increased to healthy and resilience levels. Genetic diversity is very important for population and domestic species is maintained uh, significant their adaptive potential that to achieve target a we have eight targets until 2030 uh, until this title uh, now the title for targets related to goal a is reducing threats to biodiversity so this is the uh, target one which talking about uh, integrated biodiversity and spatial planning. This is very important because last period we see the uh, uh, expansion of urban area on wide area. Uh, spatial planning is very important and effective management for our natural resources. This is the key uh, topics we need to care about this. You, as you know, when we are going to work on uh, rehabilitation, this is very cost. So maybe the conservation step is more benefit than rehabilitation and minimum, the cost will be minimum than rehabilitation. So we need to bring the use of areas of high biodiversity importance, ecosystem of high ecological integrity close to zero by 2030. These rights of indigenous people and local communities where are mean we not have, will not, we don't need to face refugees because nature. Now, where have case many uh, refugees in many countries, but today we're facing big problem about uh, climate refugees. Now we don't uh, need to face other problem of refugees from loose biodiversity and loose natural resources. So we need to care about this topic. Target two is talking about 30 percent this is 30 by 30 and this was a uh, very hard target and very important because as you know in IC targets we was talking about 70 percent of uh terrestrial and 10 percent of marine uh, protected area but now we are talking about 30 percent that mean we face big problem when we're increasing the percentage that mean we really have now a big a big challenge to 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 can cover or keep by diversity so now we're talking about 30% globally for terrestrial and inland water as a protected area 
but the most, most important thing we need to focus on it, it is effective restoration and effective management for this protected area. I don't need to have announced protected area only in paper. I need to take action and effect management and uh, for this protected area to can reach the target and reach my target and goal. Uh, target three is very important, and uh, it is thirty percent uh, for for uh, that. Maybe the first. I I am sorry for the target two for integrity and uh, restoration, but in this target it is for effective and management for protected area to large uh, uh, scapes and work on it for, for for both marine and terrestrial. Target four is to work on uh, urgent management action of extension of non-threatened species. This is very important to have uh, ex situ and uh, in situ conservation. Uh, maybe ex situ and in situ conservation, uh, one of tool to can keep the species uh, and uh, threatened species, which we can lose if not take action for it. The sustainable management is very important uh, the uh, maintain and restore the genetic diversity and habitat for this genetic diversity, one of main of uh, main of important thing. Uh, target five, we talking about harvesting and trade for wild species. We we know the action which they ta which taken from scientists. Uh, maybe one of uh, active tools, but we need more and more to can stop and killing a species for trade or trade it illegally. So the sustainable and legal preventing of species is very important and reducing the risk of this to protecting it uh, uh, during customary sustainable use by indigenous people and local communities. I think this target to eliminate, minimize, reduce, and or mitigate the impact of invasive species. Since 1993, uh, from beginning of convention, we're talking about invasive species. We all people know what the effect of invasive species. Now we need really to take action, at least to minimize a potential of invasive species, at least fifty percent by twenty thirty. This action, if taken, we can give rehabilitation or rehabilitation for native species and them nature to take or to have chance to back. Already have the effect of invasive, invasive species, for example, prosobas, how can effect on land and uh, groundwater and on other species and uh, wild species and other plant. This is one of uh, example for that. Maybe we now need in this uh, uh, years to take action to minimize the effect of it. Our people know the negative impact of pollution. We know how uh, pollution, how can affect on, on, on uh, biodiversity, nutrients, uh, pesticides, uh, all human activities which cause uh, uh, negative impact on uh, biodiversity, which pollute our nature. This is need to take action. Now reduce pollution risk. Uh, uh, not harmful to biodiversity and ecosystem function and surfaces, but nutrients just to the environment. We need to reduce it pesticides, high, high, uh, highly hazardous chemicals. So we need to think about other uh, activity, maybe pollinators now, uh, and EU have uh, initiative to work with uh, pollinators. This is where more effective and can be uh, other uh, activity than pesticides. And, and on other side, we have now eliminated plastic pollution and we hope during the coming years uh, that UNIP have approval uh, of uh, on uh, plastic uh, convention. Now maybe Jordan work on uh, as member of INC uh, with Secretary General, uh, but that's need in the future to take action and approve that, like what happened in BBB and G uh, last uh, two days ago in Panama. 
minimize the impact of climate change and ocean acidification. This is all people know climate change. Now we're talking about climate change and what the how we can face the effect of climate change. Maybe in, in last time we're talking about biodiversity as one of solution for climate change, but not take action. Maybe last in COP27, when we have initiative about nature-based solution coming from COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, all people take see what mean nature-based solution. And now we have initiative related to nature-based solution. Now, this is one of things we can use it. An eco-based approach. Now we have many uh, activities can replace and have reached for uh, people to can have a good life and get, get benefit from biodiversity without losing with uh, if we take a sustainable use of the uh, ecosystem surfaces. Now we have positive impact of climate change action on biodiversity uh, for uh, fostering an ecosystem-based approach is very important, and we it is one uh, solution to face that global problem. Now, maybe in, in, in mainstreaming, this is for targets, but it is important to take uh, this note. Now, when we adopt the framework, we not adopt only framework. We adopt a package of decisions. Uh, these decisions, including mainstreaming, financing, uh, or uh, what's called a resource mobilization decision, we were talking about digital sequence and form decision. All this is coming as package because we cannot implement the framework without this, as what mentioned before. Now, Goal D, if we back to goal D in target 12, 14, and 15, with supporting mainstreaming. So that decision number 15 on 17 support the long-term strategic approach of mainstreaming. This for mainstreaming decision and the main topic in this decision related to mainstreaming and to face the specific challenges by developing countries, establish the informal adversary group of mainstreaming of biodiversity, which announced before a few weeks ago from uh, uh, secretary, request parties, other governments, international organization and driven stakeholders to submit their views on the uh, draft, uh, request the executive secretary to organize, which we done before, uh, a few weeks and now maybe in uh, uh, Thursday we'll be reviewing that and put that plan during uh, Sabista Bureau meeting and hope to have action early by this year and next year before COP16. Uh, all people talking about capacity building and uh, we know how the uh, framework is ambition framework. So capacity building is very important for part, especially for uh, developing countries. So uh, we need to fully implement of common material and convention. Uh, so the gaps it is uh, found in. in Uh, 16, 17, uh, 18, and uh, 19 of the convention, targeted 20 uh, support needs of capacity building needs and minimize the gaps of implementation between parties focusing on capacity building. Now, COP has a decision, decision number 15 on eight. This is related to uh, capacity building. So we have long-term strategic framework for capacity building and development. The parties should work on the national uh, and be, uh, capacity building needs, depending on a global framework. And this is one of topics need to work on uh, national and BSAPs. Uh, at the national targets uh, for for uh, depending or um, related to uh, global targets and both what we need during these national targets. As you know, the, the framework is very ambitious and need uh, many 
resource of mobilization to implement this. So if we're reviewing the uh, framework section C23, uh, but point, section C, uh, point 23, which talking about resource mobilization, target 18, target 19, it is very important. Target 19 was legit deeply, and we care to have a clear uh, suggest to for resource mobilization covers and how we can implement the fund. In addition, uh, for resource mobilization, we have decision 15 on seven, uh, for these main topics regarding to have the uh, global biodiversity frame framework fund and national finance. One of things important related to resource mobilization uh, have uh, three annexes in this uh, decision. The first is, is building and the structure of phase one uh, for 23, uh, 2023 and 2024. Uh, the second terms of reference for the advisory committee on resource mobilization. The third is term of reference for technical expert group on finance financial report, reporting. Uh, now, one of thing we need to focus on it, DSI decision. In DSI, we have benefits from DSI. So, I think the global fund, our global diverse fund need to have established and uh, how we can take these uh, uh, benefits from the SI sequencing to the global fund. This is one of mechanism need to uh, work on it in coming days. Now COP16 very important and, and need to finish our work. Uh, one of the first step now need from parties is to uh, revise them and be saps by COP16 uh, and the finance strategy. By COP16, we can have a clear have a clear mechanism for resource mobilization because we need we look for national targets and and resource finance uh, strategy from parties to can see yes this amount I need it ready in in and feel this time so. I can work on it and have a clear vision. And the second things we finishing that, maybe we hope to finish that, and by COP16, the uh, mechanism of a global biodiversity fund, uh, and see how we build this resource mobilization uh, framework and how we can work on it in the future related to other resources, for example, DSI and uh, implement uh, uh, target 19. Th this is for, for finally, and I hope uh, I cover what you need. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, more welcome. And thank you for hosting this important meeting. Many thanks, Engineer uh, uh, Bilal. Indeed, uh, all very interesting. Many thanks also to Anteo for this uh, broad, let's say, overview of what has been decided uh, with respect to the global biodiversity framework. We are slightly late. There are some questions that indeed can be other uh, replied by the speakers, so let's say, on the way or can be kept, let's say, for the very final question and answer session. You can also reply directly on the chat, uh, both Mr. Sun and Mr. Uh, Kishats. And with these, we close this uh, overview of the main outcomes of COP15 and the pass the floor to Patrick Beggert from DG Environment, who will be moderating the next uh, session. Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alessandra. Um, yes, following quickly on, as you say, to try and keep with the with the timetable. So we now move to the next session, uh, how to implement COP15 decisions in the Mediterranean, um, with including with a focus on three areas, restoration, protected areas, spatial planning, uh, mainstreaming biodiversity protection into agriculture and fisheries, and financing and resource mobilization. Um, now, uh, just to start this session, I'd like to pass the floor then to uh, two countries for their country for the country views. So, firstly, to uh, Mr. Reda Benhima, uh, Head of Department of Preservation of Biodiversity, uh, Ministry of Energy, Transition and Sustainable Development of Morocco. So, Mr. Benhima, the floor is yours.
Bonjour. Vous voyez donc, vous voyez donc euh, ma, ma présentation? No, not at the moment. Yes, we can see oui, that, oui. actually. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Alors, bonjour à toutes et à tous, euh, mesdames et messieurs. Je me réjouis de participer à ce webinaire important axé sur le cadre mondial pour la biodiversité Côte-Mine Montréal euh, et les perspectives de sa mise en œuvre aux échelles nationales. Tout d'abord, euh, je voudrais. Euh, saluer cette initiative et remercier l'Union pour la Méditerranée d'avoir invité le Maroc d'en prendre part. Mesdames et messieurs, comme il a été expliqué par mes prédécesseurs, la COP15 a été marquée par l'adoption d'un nouveau cadre mondial pour la biodiversité, qualifié de l'historique, euh, qui comprenait quatre objectifs pour 2050 et 23 cibles décinales. Ce qu'il faut savoir, c'est que les travaux de la dite COP15 ont permis également l'adoption de plusieurs projets de décision ayant pour objectif le soutien de la mise en œuvre du cadre mondial. Et en tant que négociateur de la délégation marocaine, je peux témoigner que la grande partie des négociations a concerné les mécanismes de mise en œuvre du cadre mondial, notamment le mécanisme de mobilisation des ressources financières dans les négociations, on conclut la création d'un fonds d'affectation spécial sous le FEM en 2023, capable d'accélérer la mise en œuvre du nouveau cadre mondial. Mesdames et messieurs, à la suite de l'adoption du cadre mondial Montréal, aujourd'hui, le travail qui incombe aux, étapes, aux, aux pays partis c'est tout d'abord l'appropriation des éléments de ce cadre mondial et des décisions connexes. S'agissant du cas du Maroc, aujourd'hui, nous sommes à pied d'œuvre de traduire les 23 cibles de Conmil Montréal en objectif national et les soumettre au secrétariat de la CDB, actualiser la stratégie et le plan d'action national de la biodiversité, mettre en place un plan de financement national de la SPAN B actualisé en tant que Côtier de, de, de mobilisation de ressources en matière de protection de la biodiversité, mettre en place un, un cadre de suivi national de mise en œuvre de la SPAN. Madame, mesdames et messieurs, il importe de signaler que la délégation marocaine a bien participé au processus d'élaboration du nouveau cadre mondial depuis son, son lancement en assistant et contribuant aux réunions du groupe de travail à composition non limitée, et, mais aussi aux travaux de la COP15 et également aux travaux préparatoires du groupe Africa. En vue de s'approprier les éléments du cadre mondial au niveau national par les différentes parties prenantes, une réunion de restitution des résultats de la COP15 est organisée d'une part pour euh, euh, analyser les enjeux liés à la mise en œuvre du cadre mondial et d'autre part, pour discuter les actions à entreprendre afin d'assurer une mise en œuvre efficace des décisions prises. Mesdames et messieurs, conformément à la décision 1415 qui met en relief des stratégies et plans d'action nationaux de la biodiversité en tant que moteur principal de mise en œuvre du cadre mondial au niveau national, le Maroc, en prélude à la mise, en, à la, à la mise à jour de sa SPAN B, a élaboré l'évaluation nationale de la biodiversité et les services écosystémiques en vue de renforcer les connaissances et les atouts et les opportunités présentées par les écosystèmes marocains ainsi que les menaces auxquelles ils sont exposés. Dans, ce, dans cette perspective, il convient de signaler également qu'un soutien financier et technique a été accordé au Maroc par le FEM dans le cadre du projet Global Biodiversity Framework Early Action Support pour assurer l'actualisation de notre SPAN B 2022-2030, sur lequel nous sommes en train de monter le projet avec nos collègues de, du PNUD au Maroc. Mesdames et messieurs, un autre jalon important pour faire progresser la mise en œuvre du cadre mondial, c'est la mobilisation des ressources financières nationales notamment en renforçant la collaboration avec le secteur privé, tout en tenant compte que les pays en développement ont véritablement besoin d'une coopération et d'un soutien international accru pour compléter leurs efforts de mobilisation des ressources nationales. Dans ce sens, il importe de signaler 
que plusieurs actions ont été entreprises au Maroc pour augmenter de manière significative la mobilisation des ressources nationales destinées à la préservation de la biodiversité à travers des systèmes innovants tels que les PSE, les, P, les, les paiements des services écosystémiques, des mécanismes de compensation ou encore par la mise en place d'un système de partage des bénéfices suite à la toute récente ratification du protocole APA par le Maroc, ce, ce qui montre euh, la, ou bien ce qui marque bien évidemment la volonté de notre pays à lutter contre l'exploitation abusive et la biopiraterie de, de ces ressources génétiques. Aussi, dans la voie d'atteindre la cible 19 du nouveau cadre mondial, le Maroc, à travers le PNUD, a soumis pour le, le FEM8 une demande d'appui pour établir son plan, son plan national de biodiversité dans le cadre de l'initiative pour la finance de la biodiversité biofit. Mesdames et messieurs, le, le cinquième et le sixième rapport nationaux euh, ont montré que le Maroc, euh, dans l'exercice de la mise en œuvre de la SPAN B, euh, 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 ancien SPAN B, a fait des progrès notables en matière d'action et de mesures sur le plan institutionnel, juridique et opérationnel. En effet, en réponse à la cible 14 du nouveau cadre mondial, le Maroc a fourni des efforts importants pour assurer pleinement l'intégration de la conservation et l'utilisation durable de la diversité biologique dans les stratégies et les politiques sectorielles, notamment à travers la réforme du système des études d'impact en intégrant des évaluations environnementales stratégiques, mais aussi à travers la mise en place de la Commission nationale du climat et de la biodiversité qui constitue un mécanisme effectif de coordination et de bonne gouvernance visant à assurer le suivi de la mise en œuvre des engagements énoncés dans les accords internationaux et leurs protocoles en relation avec le changement climatique et la diversité biologique. Mesdames et messieurs, euh, nous sommes conscients que la mise en œuvre du cadre mondial post-2020 est confrontée à un contexte encore plus difficile que celle d'Aïchi. Par conséquent, euh, nous considérons que la réussite de la mise en œuvre du nouveau cadre mondial, avec les, bien évidemment les changements transformateurs voulus, passe fort, fortement par un investissement qui soit à la hauteur des attentes en matière de renforcement des capacités, de transfert de technologies et renforcement de la coopération nord-sud, sud-sud et triangulaire, notamment en apportant aux pays éligibles l'appui financier nécessaire à la mise en œuvre de ce cadre mondial aux échelles nationales. Enfin, je ne peux clore mon, mon intervention sans réatterrer l'engagement du Royaume du Maroc à soutenir activement la coopération multilatérale, régionale, triangulaire ou bilatérale dans la, la, la mise en œuvre de ce cadre mondial ambitieux et à continuer à honorer ses engagements au titre de la Convention sur la diversité biologique. Merci, mesdames et messieurs. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Thank you very much, Mr. Ben Hima, for that perspective from Morocco. I think that's very interesting to hear um, a national viewpoint in the, the challenges of implementing then the COP15 decisions. Um, the next uh, speaker will be from then giving a national perspective is from Spain. And I pass the floor then to Miss Noelia Vallejo Pedregal, Head of Area Ministry for Ecological Transition and the Democratic a Demographic Challenge from Spain. You have the floor. Good morning, colleagues. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll try to share my screen here, which I think it should be this one. Can you confirm that you can see my screen now? Oh, sorry. Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Hmm. So wait, now let me just try to put it uh, in a possible mode and then, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And many thanks to the Union for the Mediterranean for organizing this uh, webinar. And of course, for giving us the opportunity to, to provide our, our views and, and experience. 
Um, Spain believes that, uh, well, the, our region, the Mediterranean, it's uh, as, a, as such as a region is a hotspot for biodiversity. Uh, and as uh, Mr. Abadi said before, we also have uh, common challenges and risk in our region, uh, like those linked to droughts, forests, fires, desertification, which are very much linked to our climate and, and landscape, and which are also very closely linked to biodiversity protection. For example, in our view, desertification, climate change, biodiversity needs to be jointly addressed. So we are convinced of the need of enhancing biodiversity as a basis for the sustainable development and for the recovery in our region. And that's why we welcome very much uh, uh, well, all the work being made uh, continuously by the Union for the Mediterranean, and in particular, uh, this opportunity that we have here today to share views on the biodiversity action following the adoption of the Global Biodiversity Framework. We are also convinced and we share very much with the Commission that was saying before uh, of the need of, uh, well, and, and also uh, other previous speakers, uh, the need to put in place urgent implementation of the, of the global framework that we adopted uh, last, uh, um, last year uh, in Montreal. Uh, and we are convinced that this is the basis to ensure a, a, a smooth and an efficient and effective implementation and to therefore fill the gaps that we had in the previous uh, um, uh, strategic plan of the, of the CBD. And we really hope that all together we achieve uh, better results this time because we have no chance. We, this is uh, not an option, it's, it's really a need. So let me share, we wanted to, to share a bit uh, our, our, well, our situation and also uh, the Spanish views and, and, and the state of uh, how we approach implementation of the uh, global biodiversity uh, framework. <laughs> so we are very happy and proud to, to, to say that Spain has been the first country to adopt and communicate to the CBD Secretariat our new uh, National Biodiversity uh, Strategic Plan, so our new MVSAP, which was adopted on 27th December, so right, uh, right one week after the COP. This was, of course, the result of a very long process. It was not uh, uh, one week after the COP that we, uh, that we made this plan, but of course, it was a long ongoing process that was undertaken in parallel with uh, all the negotiations and discussions. And it was based always on the highest level of ambition that we were advocating for at the international level. And therefore we were reflecting that also at the national level. So um, of course we still uh, need to do the, the fine tuned correlation with the global biodiversity framework, but uh, we foresee that we are very much in line with the ambition of the global framework because that's how the whole process uh, was conceived. Uh, the reference is already available, as I said, in the in the CBD webpage. And uh, during the process, I would like to highlight that the, it was a very uh, participatory process. So uh, the draft of the plan was uh, prepared by the by the Ministry of uh, Ecological Transition and Demographical Challenge, so by the Ministry in charge of biodiversity, but uh, working in collaboration and, and in consultation in several rounds of consultations with the other different ministries involved. Um, also with the participation of the regional uh, commu autonomous communities, so the regional authorities, which host uh, a, a big share of the um, management and nature management um, competences in Spain. So there was a close uh, coordination with them also through the specific uh, sectorial conferences and, and organisms that we have for, for coordination, for charter coordination. Um, it was also the result of uh, several uh, public participation procedures. There was one public consultation at the very beginning, early stage before starting the drafting to gather views on priorities and on, on issues that needed to be addressed by the plan. And then once the plan was preliminary drafted, it was also uh, subject to public information, but also subject to uh, direct consultation to the main stakeholders, uh, both NGOs and relevant sectors, which are represented in the State Council for Natural Heritage and Biodiversity. And finally, we wanted to stress that uh, it was also subject because this was required as such by our law uh, to strategic environmental assessment, which of course concluded uh, that it had uh, basically a positive impact for the environment, both biodiversity and other environmental aspects. 
So, uh, as I said, uh, the the content, uh, well, yeah, the content of, of this uh, plan is very much aligned with the the Kumin Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, but also with other international conventions. And I would like to highlight that it's also very much in line with the EU biodiversity strategy uh, that was also, uh, I mean, it was actually adopted uh, in 2020 and it was um, a, a very important guide uh, for all for us in, in, in developing and in, in preparing our MBSAP. Uh, it was a, a key reference and we have always tried to at least maintain uh, and respond to the high level of ambition that this biodiversity strategy has. And of course, it's directly applicable uh, because uh, of course we, we follow the European uh, policy. So it's very much aligned and it's a, a, a very important reference. So what's the content of, of our strategic plan? First of all, and according to what uh, our basic legislation uh, foresees, uh, it's based on an assessment on the status and trends of uh, biodiversity uh, in our country, but also, uh, well, in a broader sense, it also takes into account the considerations and, and information from IPBS and other international uh, relevant information. But it is also based on the national indicators on biodiversity. Uh, and also, of course, on a, on a final assessment of the previous strategic plan and on a consideration of what were the main uh, gaps and lessons learned that were taken into account for the development of this new plan. It includes then the both qualitative and quali quantitative objectives to be achieved during the implementation of the plan. And to that aim, it sets uh, a set of uh, actions to be undertaken by the national administration. Uh, and uh, an estimation of the budget needed for that actions to be put in place. So I will just uh, go a bit, touch a bit uh, on on a bit some of the of the content and how they relate with the global uh, biodiversity framework. But of course, aware of the time, I will try to be brief and and not go in, into much detail. But I would just like to highlight, I mean, how it really uh, it really responds in our view to the global biodiversity framework. So uh, the plan has uh, eight main lines of actions and which are, are then um, developed and further described with specific actions and uh, to be undertaken and specific objectives. So first of it, uh, it concerns knowledge, improving knowledge for biodiversity. Uh, and this is very much in line with uh, target 21 uh, of the global framework that uh, highlights the need for based available knowledge and, and data on biodiversity to be available both for decision makers and also for the general public. And this is actually what we are aiming at. On the one hand, through uh, reinforcement of the monitoring system, but also of the system for management of information and systematization of this information in order to ensure uh, that uh, every data available, um, it's managed in a way that it's useful for decision taken and that it's also accessible and uh, and and that it's uh, yeah it's it's been uh, very uh, taking good uh, use of it and all of these will be a canal channel through the nature data bank that it's uh, the, the public uh, data bank of information for biodiversity in hosted by the ministry uh, in this uh, set of actions we have also foreseen the adoption of the biodiversity and science a strategy which was actually also adopted in December last year so it was quite a busy uh, month as you can see for us uh, and this strategy tries to highlight and tries to enhance how the results of science are available for decision making and also tries to uh, enhance that science focus on decision making needs and management needs uh, so so that we ensure and to improve this link between science and biodiversity. Second line of action, it's about protection and conservation of uh, nature and biodiversity. And here we have a range of actions that are very much uh, related with target four of the global biodiversity framework on conservation of species with uh, also particular attention to, to certain groups like, for example, pollinators, where we uh, already have a previous strategy that we want to reinforce its implementation. And it also has to do, and it also, well, uh, uh, includes um, the commitments through uh, target three of the, of the global biodiversity framework on protected areas. Spain is committed to achieving 30% of protection 
both in our terrestrial uh, areas as in our marine. And we also, we already have a plan on how to achieve it and a calendar uh, during these uh, next 10 uh, years. Uh, but this section of the plan also puts lots of emphasis on the connectivity and on the effective management and effective conservation uh, on these areas to ensure that they provide conservation results and really an improvement. The third line of action is on recovery and restoration, and this has, of course, much to do with target two of the Global Biodiversity Framework, which focuses on restoration. Um, the plan has uh, a series of uh, quantitative uh, objectives for the restoration of, uh, let's say, for example, 200,000 hectares of forest, uh, 200,000 hectares uh, of wetlands, and other objectives in that sense. But this will also be further developed uh, through the national restoration strategy that will be, need to be developed in the in the coming years. Uh, this section also has to do with target 10 on sustainable activities on agriculture, forestry, fisheries and agriculture, and, and agriculture but also uh, keeps uh, an eye on ecosystem services and promoting through restoration, uh, promoting benefits for people and for society. So it also has a relation with target uh, uh, 11 and 12. There are specific reference to nature-based solution, uh, which as uh, a previous speaker were highlighting, it's a very important um, outcome of the global biodiversity framework and that we also recognize as a key uh, factor for, for the implementation of our national plan. The fourth life of action has to do with uh, addressing specific threats uh, to biodiversity. And here we address invasive alien species. So uh, responding to target six of the global biodiversity framework, there are actions to continue to reinforce the existing policy to address uh, species protection. Uh, we foresee to adopt a, a new specific plan to address uh, pathways of introduction uh, and also uh, we foresee the adoption of uh, new regulation on wildlife breeders as a way to, to avoid a certain uh, risk on invasive alien species. And there is also a, a, a political commitment that it's reflected in our national strategy to address the closure of all American mink um, uh, areas in Spain uh, as a way to, to really finally avoid the impacts of, of this invasive alien species in our territory. Um, it also, in this in these lines of action, we also address uh, climate change, so very much in line with target eight of the global biodiversity framework, uh, both to reduce climate change, but also to uh, uh, address the impacts of climate change on biodiversity, and there are several specific actions on that regard for the next uh, few years. Uh, there are also specific uh, measures and activities to address pollution in line with uh, target seven of the global framework. And I would like to highlight uh, a particular attention that is paid in our, in our action plan uh, to addressing forest fires. Uh, we believe this is a very important factor for biodiversity loss or, or risk um, in the Mediterranean and, and that needs to be dealt with. So all action that we had to take uh, against forest fires, we consider it has a, a direct um, positive impact on biodiversity. Finally, this section also addressed changing lifestyles, and this has uh, much to do with the transformative change that is advocated by the Global Biodiversity Framework. Uh, so this is also taken into account. Uh, the next section is about international commitments. And here I would like to, to highlight that the, the plan stressed uh, the need to contribute to international, um, international improvement on biodiversity through the promotion of international uh, co uh, cooperation. And in that regard, um, then the next uh, uh, the, well, um, director plan for international uh, development cooperation from Spain that it's being drafted now, it's going to include a specific line focusing on biodiversity, which was not the case in the previous one. And this of course uh, will be very helpful in our view to help escalate uh, the external action for biodiversity from Spain. So I think I'm coming to my last uh, uh, slide here. Uh, on the section of financing, uh, we address both the issue of uh, incentives, so in line with target 18 of the global framework, and also we address uh, all the different uh, uh, priorities uh, which are highlighted under target 19. So 
uh, we are advocating here through the national plan, both for an uh, uh, improvement of domestic uh, finance and domestic resources in other senses, also, uh, also human resources for biodiversity in the public administration. Uh, but it also addresses the need for uh, mainstreaming and alignment of biodiversity uh, in all different public uh, funds and, and budgets. Uh, then on the section on, on business and the, and the private sector, uh, this is the link with target 15 of the global biodiversity framework and very much in line with it. Um, the, uh, initi the Spanish Initiative for Business and Biodiversity, uh, it's been um, enhanced and promoted since the last year. Uh, this platform exists already uh, from uh, almost a decade ago, but now it's been uh, pushed with a new uh, concept, uh, a new uh, practical community where uh, interested businesses, not only those that belong to the, to, the, to the platform, but also other smaller enterprise can engage and, and share practices and also learn how to, how to better uh, contribute to biodiversity. So we are also working and focusing on that line for the next years. And then finally, uh, there is a final section or line of action for reinforcement of the governance system and of the legislative framework. So a revision of the basic legislation and, and a reconsideration of whether we need to reinforce the basic legislation, but also a, a review of the operation of the State Council on, nation, of, on Nature and Biodiversity, which is uh, the organism that we have to ensure uh, engagement and, and public participation. So this goes very much in line with target 22 and 23 of the framework, I would say. And with that, uh, I hope I didn't take uh, too much time and I hope uh, this can be useful for colleagues to see how we are um, addressing the implementation of the global framework. And thank you very much again uh, for this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Malejo Pedregal, uh, for that uh, perspective from Spain. I think it's extremely interesting as well to have uh, have the two different perspectives from countries uh, around the Mediterranean, Mediterranean because there are clearly specificities as well uh, and errors that will be in common between the countries and specificities for the Mediterranean region as well. Um, now in a slight change for the agenda, um, I just want to I'll pass the suggest to pass the floor to um, Miss Elisabetta Balzi, so Head of Unit uh, Healthy Oceans and Seas uh, here, DG Research and Innovation of the European Commission because um, I know that she has to leave soon after that, and then we will go back to uh, the UFM. So, uh, Ms. Balzi, I pass the floor to you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I hope, uh, can, you, can you hear me? Can you hear me and can you see Yes, me? yeah, we can hear you. We can see your presentation as well. Thank you very much. So many thanks and many thanks to the Union for the Mediterranean for organizing this very important workshop. I would like to briefly um, show you how we are contributing to the global biodiversity framework and particularly in the area of marine and waters and through our EU research and innovation program mainly. Um, if I can just, yes. So I just would like to refer to last week, our ocean conference where uh, the commission announced 40 new commitments for actions in 2023 with more than 800 million euros of investments to, for actions to restore and protect the ocean, of which more than 300 million for ocean research to protect marine biodiversity and the address the impact of climate change on the ocean. And this includes a new important initiative that we launched to more than just one year ago, the EU mission Restore Our Ocean and Waters. I would like to give you a very short uh, information about this initiative and uh, the digital twin of the ocean, which is also part of a mission, and it's a commitment by our president, Ursula von der Leyen, that we would deliver it by 2024, a precursor of a digital twin of the ocean, and also activities, for example, uh, on the All Atlantic Ocean Research and Innovation Alliance, but also uh, with the Mediterranean. Um, our mission, uh, Restore Our Ocean and Waters, it's a strategic uh, broad mobilization initiative. It stems from, and it's rooted in research innovation, it goes far beyond research and innovation. And uh, you see that we have three main objectives in our mission. And the first one is to protect and store uh, marine and freshwater ecosystems and biodiversity. So this is very relevant uh, for this context. And we have specific targets. Among them, we are aiming at uh, contributing to the targets of the marine nature restoration targets including uh, degraded seabeds and coastal ecosystems. So um, 
This is why I would say the mission is particularly relevant in this context. We are implementing the mission through a concept that we call the lighthouses, which are actually the sites uh, where we demonstrate, develop, and develop, deploy the mission activities across all EU seas and river basins. We have four lighthouses, focusing each of them on one of the three objectives. So we have a lighthouse on the Baltic and North Sea on, the, on making the blue economy carbon neutral and circular, one in the Mediterranean uh, with a focus on preventing and eliminating pollution, and two on the, uh, the objective of protecting and restoring marine and freshwater ecosystems in the Atlantic and in the Danube. Now, uh, the focus is not exclusive. That means that the Mediterranean uh, Sea Basin Lighthouse, which is uh, um, particularly relevant in this context, of course, as a focus to start on pollution, but it will also have to address uh, the other objectives, including protecting and restoring marine and freshwater ecosystems and biodiversities. So you see here the uh, targets of the Mediterranean lighthouse as far as pollution is concerned, so the reduction of at least 50% of plastic litter, 30% microplastic, and 50% uh, of nutrient losses. But as I said, also in, in Mediterranean, we aim at uh, addressing uh, the objective of protecting and restoring biodiversity, and we have actions in this respect. Uh, we are implementing the mission as a joint effort, so it's not uh, only a matter of the European Commission or the EU programs, but it's really a matter of working together, and that's why uh, also the collaboration with the Union for Mediterranean is key. And we are very grateful and acknowledge that the Union for Mediterranean is participating officially to our mission, uh, as um, stated in two declarations, ministerial declaration of the UFM last year. Um, now, how are we contributing through our EU research innovation program, Horizon Europe? For the mission itself, for this mission uh, only, we have already dedicated uh, around 350 million of euros for research innovation projects in the first three years, uh, 2021 to 2023. And uh, so each year about 120 million of euros, we have selected the first wave of projects uh, and we are selecting a, a second um, wave of projects for portfolio project from uh, 2022. And we have a call for proposals open now for um, new projects uh, for the year 2023. Uh, our projects are reflecting uh, specifically the three objectives of the mission. So we have a series of portfolio of research innovation projects on the objective of protecting and restoring biodiversity. Here, just to give you some examples, we have uh, now uh, funded, recently funded a series of projects on uh, marine protected areas management and also um, the restoration of degraded ecosystems. Um, so we have a couple of projects which started on this uh, subject. Uh, then, in addition to the mission, which is quite specific, uh, we have other areas of research across our Horizon Europe framework program, in particular in the, um, in the um, cluster six, we have an intervention area on healthy seas and oceans, and we already uh, funded in the first year of uh, Horizon Europe, um, more than 10 projects, new projects with a new contribution of more than 80 million of euros in the area of marine biodiversity and ecosystems. So we have an important portfolio already supported through this new framework program, in addition to all the research, which is still ongoing from the pre previous framework program, Horizon 2020. Uh, these are examples, I will not go into the details, but I think the slides will be shared, of projects that have been uh, recently funded in the main part of our Horizon Europe World Program on marine biodiversities. And you see for a total budget already of 100 million of euros addressing different issues of um, marine biodiversity. Um, and then we have, uh, you see in the bottom of the slide, you, we have uh, other calls ongoing, and I invite you to consult them and uh, to participate on, uh, for example, on the restoration of deep sea habitats or on the demonstration of marine and coastal infrastructures as hybrid blue-green nature-based solutions 
or still on selective breeding program for organic aquaculture. So these are examples of topics um, which are uh, open uh, for uh, in the course of proposals. Uh, then I just wanted to quickly refer to uh, other instruments which are relevant and contributing to the biodiversity targets. And the first one is the partnerships, the partnerships that we have with the member states. So this, and I would like to refer to one of our uh, several partnerships that we are supporting. One is dedicated to the sustainable blue economy. It's a partnership that has been uh, recently launched with uh, nearly a half billion uh, euros investment uh, with a high number of partners from 25 countries. So in these partnerships, the uh, commission joins efforts with national programs from different countries. And here many Mediterranean countries are also participating. And the vision and the goal is to boost the transformation towards a climate neutral, sustainable and productive blue economy by 2030, uh, while creating and supporting the conditions for a healthy ocean for the people by 2050. Uh, the partnership has a strategic research and innovation agenda with different pillars. Um, so uh, the blue economy solutions towards climate neutrality, a thriving blue economy for the people, blue economy in harmony with nature and an integrated and responsive ocean governance. These are the pillars of the uh, strategic research agenda. And then there are a series of key enablers. There are three intervention areas uh, where call for proposals for research and innovation are uh, done uh, on the ocean, ocean digital twin, blue generation marine uh, structures on planning and managing sea uses on healthy blue food uh, and on enabling the green transition of blue food production. Uh, there are calls ongoing, presently ongoing. The first call was open uh, last month and again we invite you to uh, consult these calls and eventually participate. Another partnership that I would like to mention, this is again a partnership between the European Commission and national programs. It's uh, a partnership for research and innovation in the Mediterranean area. And uh, this is, it's, um, it, was, it was started in uh, 2018, uh, it's a 10 years initiative, uh, and it's focusing on water and agri-food systems management. Uh, here you see how that there are 19 uh, Euromed countries which are involved and collaborating with their respective programs. Uh, the partnership has um, is working on uh, three main pillars of research innovation, the management of water, the farming systems, and the agri-food value chain. So uh, there are uh, action lines supported under water saving solutions, land and water sustainability, water governance systems, then on smart and sustainable farming, on pests and pathogens in farming, nutrition and health, reducing losses and waste, and new agro-food business models. And here again, uh, biodiversity has an important aspect of these uh, research lines. Uh, this partnership has supported already, invested already again more than a half billion of euros in the last years as a joint effort between the Commission and the Member States. Um, uh, and I think I would like to conclude here with just this uh, panorama landscape of how our research innovation, different initiatives are contributing to uh, also to the biodiversity, uh, global biodiversity framework in our uh, blue area. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Balzi, for, for that presentation, which is, again, extremely interesting, I think, to show the uh, existing programs that exist under uh, AU level, <coughs> excuse me, that are relevant particularly for, for the Mediterranean. Um, I will now pass the floor to, um, uh, in accordance then with the agenda, then to, I'll pass the floor back to Ms. Alessandra Sensi of the UFM to give a short overview of existing programs, initiatives in the region, which are relevant for the, uh, um, the global biodiversity framework. Alessandra, you have the floor. Many thanks, Patrick, and many thanks, uh, colleagues. I will link actually with what has been uh, presented up to now. I mean, also in very, very briefly, an overview of uh, uh, the UFM Greener Med agenda 
that was approved, uh, let's say, in 2021 and set the path, let's say, towards 2030. Uh, as most of you uh, know, uh, the UFM <coughs> indeed is uh, uh, made up of 43 uh, countries, the Euro-Mediterranean countries. We have two co-presidencies. We have them actually speaking uh, today, opening uh, this uh, webinar from the EU and uh, Jordan. And the UFM operates a different level, which are indeed ministerial declaration, platforms or dialogues, projects, initiative programs. And this is indeed, I mean, to create a convergence around common agendas, ensure ownership of the 43 countries which do operate on an equal footing and pooling indeed the technical, human and financial resources. So among the very latest UFM ministerial declaration, which are indeed the relevance for this uh, um, specific webinar, I'd like uh, indeed to emphasize the ministerial environment and climate action, which we recently uh, had adopted by the 43 in 2021, together indeed with the one on sustainable blue economy, which is a strongly um, linked, uh, of course, to the health of our uh, Mediterranean Sea, as well as to the one on research and innovation that was just uh, presented and referred to by Ms. Balzi. So uh, together with the adoption of the ministerial declaration, we had indeed the adoption of the Greener Method Agenda, which is indeed the environment uh, agenda of the Union for the Mediterranean, together with an implementation plan and a monitoring reporting and evaluation system. The agenda goes around three main axes, which are, of course, interlinked. One is the transition towards green circular and socially inclusive economy, without which indeed uh, uh, these negative impacts on our biodiversity cannot be reversed, prevention and reduction of pollution on land, air and sea, and a dedicated access indeed on natural resources, ecosystem uh, restoration. And uh, at, uh, let's say at uh, all levels and in biodiversity. Very, very quickly, this is uh, the theory of change we use. And basically, we do refer to a broad basis of uh, regional projects that are running in the region. And the theory of change uh, tries to link uh, basically these uh, uh, financial efforts and technical efforts to indeed the, the SDGs uh, in terms of uh, impacts and progress uh, uh, as far as indicators are concerned. Um, this, of course, has generated uh, a needed selection also of the indicators uh, as the one that are referred to here are among the very few that are uh, indeed available and trackable for uh, the entire Euro-Mediterranean region, so for the 43 countries. So this was this initial criteria used, of course, I mean, this is a living document, a living framework, and the idea is to get it improved, even with the boost of the uh, COVID-15 decision over the years. This is more or less how the structure works. So we have, you know, all the regional, uh, let's say, projects pulling into a um, sort of uh, compilation of the information provided on an annual basis, and it did. Together with that, we do, uh, a, a, let's say, continuous analysis of where we stand at Mediterranean level, together with uh, planned external evaluation every five years. This is just to give you a flavor of uh, uh, what I was referring to before. I mean, we try to have a clear overview of uh, who is behind, actually, and who supports these uh, um, 187 regional multi-country projects. Consider that this figure, in a certain way, is underestimated as it includes the projects that are closing now, but not those that are in the making according to the new programming. Um, knowing, of course, that uh, the EU is uh, among the main, let's say, uh, contributors to uh, the regional efforts. This is more or less what we show at um, the various, let's say, gathering that we have, annual or biannual gathering of the environment group. Uh, so where we stand in terms, let's say, of project and project distribution among uh, the different uh, axes indicating as well who is more or less so let's say, involved in terms of countries and which are the areas more or less covered. I mean, the level of details goes also to the coverage of the key actions uh, according to each axis. So I'm just showing the one related to access three. And uh, this shows as well, uh, you know, the progress over time. We had the baseline assessment that was produced on Greener Map 
in 2021 with reference date to 2020, and we are indeed showing uh, the progress, let's say the trend uh, over time. So this applies also in terms of uh, countries' distribution of both, uh, uh, let's say, projects or so financing and uh, teams. Uh, I'd like also uh, to uh, make a more, um, let's say, a clearer connection between the COP15 outcome that comes in terms of thematics and there is a work on the current UFM1. We have, of course, restoration of the ecosystem nature-based solution. Wetlands uh, is uh, among uh, um, the ones together, of course, that we tackle systematically with MedWet, uh, forest and landscape restoration with the field and the FIMED. Uh, we have, uh, um, let's say, uh, clear and uh, long-term collaboration on some marine protected areas, in particular with uh, MEP and uh, UNIMAP, uh, West Med, uh, and uh, as it was meant and also with the Mediterranean Lighthouse and Prima, as far as uh, pollution in particular related to agricultural practices, it's a uh, uh, concern. Uh, the Mediterranean, the UFM have been focusing also and do so also on uh, plastic uh, uh, pollution um, within, let's say, the general effort also on waste management, and there is a particular focus on uh, marine litter. This is associated to the overall transition that the region has been calling for since uh, 2014 to green circular economy through sustainable consumption, production, and resource efficiency. And uh, um, let's say it's uh, coupled by uh, dedicated efforts that we have to a partnership with the FOCM Prima and One Planet on uh, sustainability in agriculture, aquaculture, fishery, and uh, forestry. This, of course, also within the efforts of the Ministerial on Sustainable Blue Economy. About the mobilization of funding, I'm not mentioning more. This is uh, what I have uh, just uh, shown to you. I just wanted to give a flavor, a uh, more concrete flavor, actually, what uh, we do. This is indeed the, the Plastic Busters Initiative that has uh, become a real uh, process at a regional level. We have been able, as you have found, to leverage and uh, to support, actually, uh, the project. So to leverage resources, but also to support the projects that have been funded over time. Uh, we produced also a policy paper with related figures, uh, as well as, uh, let's say, coordination with other related uh, topics, indeed, uh, from waste management, to sustainable consumption and production, um, indeed, the impacts uh, on uh, biota, on uh, fishery, and so on, with all key actors in uh, the region. Very recently, we had also another liberal project, specifically on sustainable tourism and, uh, uh, let's say, marine litter. For uh, wetlands, these are indeed alarming figures we are playing on. Uh, so again, with uh, MedWet, we have been producing a policy paper that's been widely disseminated, and we organize uh, annual conferences, indeed on the state of art of uh, wetlands. Among the achievements also to be mentioned is the uh, Ramsar resolution it was just approved in November 22 on wetlands as nature based solution. With uh, uh, MAPAM, we have been uh, joining forces on the occasion of uh, the uh, conclusions, actually, of uh, uh, two important interact med finance projects on uh, marine protected areas and the impacts of climate change in MPAs. And this is more or less, let's say, the um, identification of the key actions of these uh, indeed projects uh, to uh, the um, access tree of the Greener Med. Uh, agenda. Uh, same uh, with uh, FO on landscape uh, uh, restoration. This is all material that you can find on our website. Of course, restoration is uh, at the core of the year or the actions for the years uh, to come. And um, this particular activity has been also connected to uh, the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration, where indeed FPO and UNEP are uh, leading the process. Uh, to conclude, uh, um, with FPO, we also have, as I said, the specific collaboration sustainable food system. These are among the many activities that have been carried out over uh, the past years, uh, together with a series of the webinars among those specifically dedicated to food waste and uh, losses. Uh, let me conclude with this. This is also a very recent collaboration that we have launched uh, with the governance uh, projects 
just kick off by the interact mag where actually the UFM is, uh, um, as a, not only did say label these uh, uh, governance projects, but also as activated technical assistance on the movement of southern and eastern Mediterranean countries that for the first time were uh, actually requested to be included in the call, because even if uh, they don't fall beyond, let's say, the scope of uh, the interagment itself, they can uh, participate as uh, associate partners, which open, of course, the way to many, uh, let's say, wide range of activities from webinars, uh, hubs, uh, uh, policy consultation, and so on, which indeed the South and Eastern Mediterranean countries can contribute to. So thank you very much, and this is all from my side. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandra, uh, for that, for the overview of the existing programs that are undertaking at uh, UFM level. I think that's very, um, that's very useful. Um, we will now return then to the stakeholders' views to get then the perspectives of different stakeholders on the CBD COP15 uh, commitments on the global biodiversity framework that was adopted there. Um, just in terms of timing, I think we can we can extend the time for the event until 11.30, so it gives us a bit more time. Um, and then just also to confirm, so uh, people, uh, the participants can feel free to uh, put a question uh, in the chat uh, which can respond to if they have a specific question also in the meantime. Uh, we'll hopefully have time for some brief question and answers. It depends then how much time we have left. And then just also indicate that we the presentations made in the course of the, uh, of the webinar um, will also be made available then subsequently to that as well, because I think there's been a lot of, obviously, a lot of information presented here, which is very useful, and people want to refer to that. So uh, next, so refer, returning to the stakeholder views, I pass the floor uh, to Mr. Khalil Atia, Director of uh, SPARAC uh, UN, UNEP MAP. Um, uh, Mr. Atia, I hope you're with us and I pass the floor to you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, I am trying to... Uh, do you see my screen? Not yet. No, we see you still. Do you see it now? Yes, now it's it. Okay, so uh, I would like to start by thinking, by uh, thanking the uh, UFM for this uh, and uh, the European uh, uh, Union for this uh, nice uh, event that uh, give the opportunity to share uh, the way in our region we will uh, uh, try to implement uh, the uh, decisions of the uh, uh, COP15 of uh, CBD. Um, <clears throat> I am the director of uh, the uh, SPARAC uh, of UNEPMAP, Barcelona Convention, the center that deals with the marine and coastal biodiversity in the Mediterranean and the Barcelona Convention. Uh, so, well, I, I won't uh, focus much on uh, this slide. It presents uh, the uh, uh, Barcelona Convention UNEP map uh, coordinating unit and uh, the six components around the Mediterranean, five uh, uh, regional activity centers and uh, the uh, uh, pollution uh, Mediterranean program. Uh, SPARAC actually is uh, uh, the uh, uh, center that deals with uh, marine and uh, region and uh, um, coastal uh, biodiversity. Uh, it uh, assists the um, uh, uh, Barcelona Convention uh, contracting parties in uh, a collective way to tackle uh, the uh, issues of uh, uh, marine and coastal uh, biodiversity conservation and. Uh, uh, marine resources, uh, sustainable use in a coordinated and uh, uh, synergic way. So uh, uh, the specially protected areas regional activity center uh, has been created in 1985. 
uh, uh, and uh, its mission is implemented around uh, several uh, topics, which are mainly inventory and mapping, uh, developing research, conservation programs, uh, coordination, uh, MPAs and uh, specially protected areas of Mediterranean importance development, capacity building, information outreach and education. Uh, as you might know, uh, Barcelona Convention has seven protocols uh, under its umbrella and uh, uh, the one uh, which is uh, of stake today is uh, the specially protected areas and biodiversity protocol. Uh, under the uh, uh, SPABID, commonly uh, called SPABID protocol, we have uh, many action plans that deal with uh, uh, the threatened and endangered species and the key habitats, including the introduction of uh, species and invasive species. So as already uh, presented, uh, some of uh, the uh, targets among uh, uh, the uh, ones under uh, the uh, global biodiversity framework that has been uh, achieved by COP15 of CBD uh, you have, uh, we have uh, target two, about 30% of areas of uh, uh, the um, uh, restoration of 30% uh, uh, of uh, areas of degraded terrestrial inland water and marine and coastal ecosystems under effective, uh, should be under effective restoration. The target three, about the 30% of terrestrial and inland water areas and marine and coastal areas uh, protected. And of course, uh, the cooperation and synergies to be enhanced uh, and uh, um, among uh, the different uh, global, regional and uh, multilateral uh, frameworks. So uh, the uh, sub-bio, is the 15 years life cycle strategic action program that enables the collective regional implementation of the Barcelona Convention specially protected areas and biodiversity uh, protocol. Uh, it, it identifies needs, uh, priorities, synergies for the conservation and sustainable use of marine and coastal biodiversity in the Mediterranean. Uh, the action proposals uh, under this uh, uh, regional strategy is uh, to build on a participative bottom-up uh, collective and uh, uh, collectively prepared and harmonized with the main biodiversity frameworks uh, at regional and global level and particularly the uh, Convention on Biodiversity Protection. Uh, the, uh, this is the uh, uh, brief uh, uh, presentation of uh, the uh, uh, process of the preparation of uh, the post-2020 Sabayu by the Barcelona Convention. And uh, it has been prepared in a very participative and uh, bottom-up process from evaluation of the, the uh, uh, previous cycle the identification of priorities and orientations at national and sub-regional uh, levels, uh, and the elaboration of the, uh, the uh, regional uh, strategy that, were, that has been adopted uh, in, 2020, in December 2021 by the 22nd COP of uh, Barcelona Convention uh, contracting parties. Uh, just to uh, tell you that it was anticipated uh, compared to the uh, uh, COP15 uh, that uh, um, adopted the uh, uh, global uh, biodiversity framework. Uh, as you know, the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, has uh, delayed the global process, but at the regional process, it was uh, uh, 
uh, it has been adopted uh, more than one year ago, but uh, perfectly aligned with uh, the global process and the global targets. This is the process. The, it's important to, uh, to uh, uh, remind that we will have, since it has been adopted and now we are starting the uh, uh, implementation, we will have a midterm assessment of the post 2020 Sabayu uh, implementation by 2025 in order to, uh, to see what is what are the gaps and what to uh, uh, revise and update uh, in order to be in line with uh, the 2030 uh, deadline. Uh, the, uh, this uh, regional uh, strategy under the Barcelona Convention on uh, Biodiversity has a vision that says by 2050, marine and coastal biodiversity is valued, conserved, restored, and uh, 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 and implemented maintaining ecosystem services, sustaining a healthy Mediterranean sea and coastal uh, uh, sea and coast uh, benefits essential for the uh, uh, people. So it has three goals. Uh, the, the first one is to reduce the threats to biodiversity with three sub-regional uh, sub-goals. Uh, the th second one is uh, to ensure that biodiversity is preserved and maintained or enhanced in order to meet people's need. And the, the, the third is uh, enable the uh, transformative change uh, and uh, uh, to uh, uh, foster tools and uh, conditions for the implementation. And the, uh, 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 the areas of intervention in order to implement the post-2020 Sabayu is uh, to rely, of course, on uh, science, to let nature breathe, to, uh, to, to tackle problems at source, and to shifting uh, paradigms in order to, uh, to have uh, real transformative change and uh, to not continue in business as usual. So this is the uh, overview of uh, the uh, other important uh, strat regional strategy that uh, has been adopted uh, also by COP22 in December 2021, which uh, relates to uh, 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 marine and uh, coastal protected areas and uh, UCMs, other effective area-based uh, area conservation measures in the Mediterranean with uh, a very participative uh, and collective regional uh, process uh, till the endorsement of the strategy, uh, as I said, by uh, COP22 of Barcelona Convention in December 2021. And this is also uh, uh, very uh, well aligned with the, the global biodiversity framework. And this is a focus uh, on very important uh, uh, part of the biodiversity conservation through uh, the, uh, uh, the marine and coastal protected areas and other ecosystem, uh, other uh, effective area-based conservation measures. Uh, and this uh, 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 strategy is uh, based on uh, uh, the main uh, ambitious quantitative and uh, qualitative improvements, improvements to be made at different level. Uh, so uh, governance is a, a, a big and important uh, topic. Uh, OECM recognition, uh, MCPA network expansion, MCPA management effectiveness, and uh, governments and stakeholder uh, effective action. And the two main targets are uh, still uh, by 2030, uh, the 30% of conservation through protected and conserved uh, MPAs <coughs> and uh, OECMs. 
And the, the second uh, target, main target, let's say, is uh, that uh, to, uh, by 2030, the number and, co and coverage of marine and coastal protected areas with enhanced protection levels is increased, contributing to the recovery of marine ecosystems. So uh, not to go through it, but to give you an idea about uh, the structure of uh, this uh, uh, strategy on uh, MPAs and OECMs, uh, it, have, uh, it has uh, five uh, pillars that I have already mentioned uh, and uh, uh, more than uh, uh, 100, it's about 128 uh, uh, priority activity actions uh, to be implemented by 2030. And uh, Matt, tell you just to, just because yes. we're running short on time, so hopefully um, you can uh, you can wrap up soon because we have a uh, three or four other speakers still from the yeah. stakeholders. Uh, I, I I won't need okay, so I I need one or two minutes to wrap up. Uh, I I won't need to uh, remind uh, ourselves of uh, the actual and present situation, which is uh, uh, far from uh, achieving the already the IC target by 2020. Uh, in, especially in terms of qualitative uh, and effectiveness uh, uh, um, uh, parameters. Uh, the MPAs so far are uh, coastal and uh, mostly in uh, the uh, European uh, waters. So a lot of efforts have to be made uh, uh, in the south of the, and east uh, of the Mediterranean in order to uh, meet uh, our uh, common ambitious uh, goals. Uh, so, um, uh, well, uh, let me tell you that we have uh, started to implement uh, the uh, regional uh, biodiversity framework, uh, which is called SABAYU, by prepare, preparing a uh, um, um, strategy for uh, resource mobilization uh, and uh, we uh, uh, have planned already very soon uh, a conference for uh, uh, donors in order to uh, present the regional uh, mobi uh, resource mobilization strategy, but also a portfolio of projects uh, uh, for a first, uh, first phase implementation that will uh, assist the uh, Mediterranean countries, and as I said, particularly the uh, southern and eastern, and some of the uh, uh, Adriatic countries, in order to uh, start implementing and uh, to be assisted and uh, supported in their efforts to uh, implement the uh, regional strategy, which is uh, perfectly aligned, and uh, at the same time, the global uh, commitments that the Mediterranean country have. Uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, well, we have under the, we are under the pressure of the time. So, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity in order to uh, present uh, the efforts under the Barcelona Convention uh, to assist the Mediterranean countries uh, in fulfilling at the same time the uh, global commitments and the regional ones for uh, biodiversity conservation and uh, marine resources sustainable use. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Khalil, for that. I think it's ex extremely interesting. It's extremely interesting to to know what's o o uh, already underway um, under uh, UNEP map and under, under the work of SPARAC. Um, I think particularly also the obviously the crucial work of uh, designating uh, marine protected areas, um, which is uh, obviously will be a real challenge and will um, is been increased obviously following the adoption of the global biodiversity framework at. Uh, Kunming, Montreal. Um, for the next speaker, I pass the floor to um, Mr. Frederick Castell, Senior Nature Resources Officer at the FAO. The FAO um, works closely with the UFM, um, especially with the biodiversity team on forestry, landscape restoration, and sustainable food systems uh, within the larger partnership of the FAO UFM uh, Chimia Prima One Planet uh, initiative. So, uh, Mr. Castell, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And let me share my screen. <coughs> uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yeah. 
Okay, so I'll try to be brief. Um, so first of all, it's really an honor to be with you and uh, thanks uh, for the invitation uh, from the, the Union for the Mediterranean uh, to give us the opportunity to present the outcome of uh, COP15 and what it means for agricultural sectors and for the Mediterranean uh, region. Um, Okay, I'll pass really quickly on some slides, uh, but uh, I really would like to emphasize that one of the main outcomes was the, the adoption of the uh, GBF. And uh, in the GBF, what is really important for us and uh, what is really important to underline is that uh, uh, over half of the targets are directly uh, linked to uh, agri-food systems. And uh, this is a, a message which is really important. Um, uh, and uh, that's where FAO has a, a, a key role to play. Um, I, I also would like to mention that there were also other decisions. There were 57 decisions in total at COP15, and 11 make a clear uh, reference and specific reference to FAO, and uh, plenty other made specific reference to uh, food, agriculture, fisheries, uh, forestry, and uh, uh, other related terms. Um, so coming back to the to, to the targets uh, related to agri-food systems, so uh, you have the list in, in front of you, and I just want to, to, to mention a few. Uh, I, I won't go into details of all of them, but uh, on, on top of the one on ecosystem restoration, which was already mentioned, there was one on invasive alien species, on reducing pollutions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, now the, the challenge will be to ensure that agriculture ministry and agri-food sectors are actively engaged in the national planning and full implementation of the GBF. And that's really a challenge ahead of us. Um, I would like to, to mention uh, one specific target, which is target 10, and it was uh, uh, presented in detail already by Anteo. Um, uh, and target 10 uh, focus on sustainable management of agriculture, aquaculture, fishery, and forestry, which is, uh, again, directly related to FAO's mandate. And um, uh, I just want to, to mention that for the broad range of uh, tools available to support the achievement of, of this uh, specific target, and this includes standards, guidelines, uh, uh, monitoring tools, code of conduct, uh, and other normative and policy instruments. I just want to mention one specific instrument, which is a framework for action on biodiversity for food and agriculture, which was uh, adopted in 2021. Uh, by the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. And uh, this framework includes uh, uh, more than 50 individual uh, actions um, uh, uh, grouped in, in three strategic uh, priority areas. But uh, again, I, I won't go in, into details. Um, I also would like to, to mention target two, uh, which was uh, also presented by Alexandra and she, she mentioned the partnership between uh, UFM and, um, and FAO. And target two is, is really relevant for, for, the, for, for the, the Mediterranean region um, uh, because uh, it, it, uh, it, it contributes to, to we we have a re partnership with uh, the, the the UFM, but again, I, I for for reason of time, I won't uh, repeat what uh, Alexandra already said, and she presented already the, the partnership and the Agadir commitment and the the Iki uh, project also, and I just maybe want to mention the the restoration flagship that was presented uh, in the context of COP15 uh, in the context of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. And uh, there was one uh, for, for the region that was uh, presented. Um, another important decision uh, from the COP, but which is not part of the GBF, is uh, the adoption of a plan of action uh, for the international uh, initiative for the conservation and sustainable use of soil biodiversity for the period 2020 and 2030, uh, 2020 2030. Uh, FAO um, uh, is invited to facilitate the implementation of this action plan through the Global Soil Partnership. And uh, 
So that's also something really important for the Mediterranean region. And again, FAO stand ready to support a country for, for, for this implementation. Um, and I, I will um, I will just uh, conclude uh, with uh, that slide. That just to say that now that have uh, that party have reached uh, an agreement, countries are expected to urgently revise and uh, update the NBSAPs, as I mentioned previously, um, and uh, to make sure that uh, they are in lines with the the GBF. So. Planning uh, represents a, a, an, an extremely important step for the translation of the framework into action at national level. Um, and uh, traditionally, uh, limited attention has been given to agricultural matters in the development of the NBSAPs uh, for various reasons. Uh, reason. So we, we must ensure that uh, in the future, uh, and BSAPs better capture the full breadth of the agri-environmental agenda. And uh, we know that the, the, the uh, country will have to review the NBSAPs for the next COP uh, at the end of 2024, and the, the COP will take place in, in Egypt. So I, I just would like to say that uh, FAO stand ready to provide guidance to country at their request uh, and to update the NBSAPs. Um, uh, we we will do that uh, in um, making sure that we also address the issue of uh, food insecurity and to eliminate hunger. We, we we think it's really important to to link that to the climate agenda also uh, to ensure that there is a coherence, but also with the other uh, uh, Rio Convention, the one on, on desertification, and uh, and also to make sure that. Uh, the, the ecosystem restoration agenda uh, is also respected in light of the of the UN decade uh, on ecosystem restoration, and uh, I will stop here. And I thank you very much for for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frederic, uh, for that uh, for the overview from from the FAO perspective. Uh, again, I think that's really useful and, and complements some of the information that we've had elsewhere. Uh, thank you for your for your participation. I know you had. Uh, more limited time. Um, as I said, just to confirm that the, 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 the PowerPoints will be made available subsequently. And so next, I would like uh, the next speaker from the stakeholders would be Miss Carol uh, Martinez, Policy Manager at uh, MedPan. And um, MedPan um, is another one of the partners that works closely with with UFM. Um, well, it's, sorry, it's a consortium of um, of, of biodiversity uh, NGOs, um, including then uh, intergovernmental ones such as IUCN, non-governmental, and also international organisations such as Medwet. So, Miss Martinez, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you very much for this kind invitation and this uh, very useful uh, webinar. I will make this uh, presentation on behalf of the Mediterranean Biodiversity Consortium, and I will uh, focus on a few targets, namely the targets on restoration, target two, the target on effective uh, conservation, target three, the target related to climate change, target eight, and the target 11 on the ecosystem services. So addressing the question about how to implement the CBD COP15 decision, uh, we can make the first statement that our region actually forestalled the final uh, negotiation of the CBD COP and uh, the global biodiversity framework. Uh, definitely, we adopted regional targets before with the SAP bio uh, mentioned by Mr. Atia and the regional strategy for MCPAs and OECMs, but as well with the EU biodiversity strategy. And what we can say as well is that uh, in terms of regional targets, we are even going beyond what is in the global biodiversity framework, particularly if we think about the strict protection or the high and full protection. So coming back to the target two and uh, the restoration, uh, we definitely don't start from scratch. We benefit already from uh, the United Nations Ecosystem Restoration Decade uh, that provide a delicate platform for stakeholders with useful resources and information. 
and definitely that wants to harness forces in order to, to reduce the degradation of ecosystem and their valuable contribution to, to the livelihoods of population. We benefit as well from the FAO uh, landscape, uh, rest, forest landscape restoration mechanism uh, with a clear objective uh, to, to support people and, and nature. Uh, the outcome to improve resilience, productivity, socioeconomic value from rest of forest and landscape. And this again, for the benefit of human well-being, local livelihoods and environments. This mechanism seeks a balance between restoring ecosystem services and productive uh, functions. You can see here actually the two countries that are benefiting uh, from this mechanism in Morocco and Lebanon through dedicated projects or two years long. It, the, this is done as well with uh, the Association Internationale des Forêts Méditerranéennes. And again, the objective is to support the countries and the stakeholders to tackle climate change mitigation, to support biodiversity conservation of endemic, emblematic uh, Mediterranean tree species, and to actively engage the local population. When it comes to the marine realm and uh, the target uh, three, as it was mentioned by Mr. Atia, there is definitely a, a big room for uh, progress. You see here uh, where are we standing in terms of uh, uh, our network of marine protected areas that to date is covering 8.3% of uh, the Mediterranean waters. And when we think about uh, <clears throat> our regional targets in terms of uh, enhancing conservation and strict protection, uh, currently the coverage is only 0.04% of uh, the Mediterranean wat water. So you, you can see that definitely there is not only uh, an urgency to act, but there is a real uh, scale up uh, dimension. If we think about the target eight, uh, something important to remind as well is that our region is not only a biodiversity hotspot, it's a climate change hotspot. And when it comes to uh, the marine ecosystem, already 90% of the marine protected area have been assessed and characterized by high vulnerability to uh, climate change and changing climatic condition. So what can we do? Definitely, we need to scale up for a well-connected, well-representative <clears throat> network of fully protected areas. And this to support not only the effectiveness of marine conservation, but as well the key resilience of this marine and coastal ecosystem that are fundamental for our population in the region. We need to invest more into ecoregionization modeling work. We need to inform better the ecosystem connectivity and how this connectivity will change over time because of the climate change. And this is uh, very much needed if we really want to support the development of, of an effective and resilient Mediterranean network of marine protected area and thus to address all regional targets and the international targets and to be successful for the 30 by 30. But uh, actually, uh, the marine conservation community in our region has uh, developed a clear roadmap that paved the way uh, to 2030, and that provides a clear uh, objectives and clear recommendation of how to make this happening, how we can achieve this uh, target three of uh, the global biodiversity framework. So we can use already all these recommendations and we can combine them with the additional um, policy paper that has been developed by Medban that includes additional uh, operational recommendations for decision makers on key issues addressing the question of the governance of these uh, marine protected areas and the co-management, the question of the high and full protection of our marine and coastal ecosystem, the management and the conservation of mobile species, the sustainable small scale fisheries, the funding, uh, but as well uh, the marine resilience in the Mediterranean Sea and the nature-based sustainable tourism. So please um, 
have a look to this document. Uh, we will be more than happy to further exchange with you and to see how together we can actually work on the, the successful implementation of this target two and target three eight uh, in our region. At last but not the least, I would like to mention this RESCOM project of uh, the Mediterranean Biodiversity Consortium that is as well supporting a tangible implementation of the target two on restoration and target three on effective conservation in our region. And this through uh, seven sites, you can see uh, the map. So uh, again, let's uh, make sure that our region can become a lighthouse, uh, a beacon of the implementation of the global biodiversity framework, and we stand ready to further collaborate with you. Again, on behalf of the Mediterranean Consortium for Biodiversity, I thank you very much for your kind attendance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carol, for, for that perspective from the from the NGOs and the, the important work you're undertaking already and the role you'll have in implementing the other commitments uh, from uh, the global biodiversity framework. So um, I thank everyone for their for their for their patience as well, obviously, because we're running slightly behind uh, uh, the agenda. Still, we have one more uh, stakeholder stakeholder to present. In this case, I would uh, give the floor to Mr. Adonai Herrera Martinez, the Director of Environment and Sustainability from EBRD, to give the uh, international financial uh, institution perspective. Um, Adana, you have the floor. You're, you're muted still for the moment. <laughs> thank you very much, Patrick. Yeah. And thanks for the warning. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Alessandra Almutaz and, and the Union for the Mediterranean colleagues for the kind invitation to, to speak here today, especially on a topic that is, that is so close to our hearts, which is biodiversity. I was lucky to be to be in the COP15 in Montreal in December last year and and, and witness the the major breakthrough moment that that occurred there. And um, I mean these these previous speakers have gone through through the global biodiversity framework, so I, I don't want to go in detail through it. Uh, four major goals, 23 targets, um, ranging from restoring and maintain, maintaining ecosystem integrity to the equitable um, sharing of benefits um, of those ecosystems, to the mobilization of resources that, that are required to achieve those, um, those targets. Uh, but that, that requires an institutional reflection to, to try to understand how to translate those targets, those 23 targets, into the modus operandi of each institution. For us, as a multilateral development bank, that means mostly uh, and among uh, um, um, above everything, restoration. Why? Well, for those of you who might be less familiar with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, we are a multilateral de development bank that invests about 12 billion euros per year in, uh, in mostly in the private sector. About 80% of our uh, investment volume is on the private sector, covering a region from Morocco to Mongolia, from Estonia to Egypt. So a very broad region around the Mediterranean and the former Soviet Union. So that, that region is characterized by highly depleted environmental infrastructure. So the systems that have been depleted significantly um, and that require restoration. That's why restoration is key um, in our historical type of investments, but also for our future. Um, when we started discussing the biodiversity agenda about three years ago within in, in the EBRD. Most of my, my colleagues, especially most of the bankers, were, you know, were uh, slightly hesitant because traditionally the protection of biodiversity has been has been um, a, a surrounded or focused on through our environmental social safeguards, especially our performance requirement six, which uh, which uh, forces our projects to to have very high standards on environmental protection. But after after some um, some thoughts and, and those those safeguards are based on the do no significant harm principle that that now the EU taxonomy and the the Commission enshrines in the um, taxonomy legislation. Um, but looking at our uh, at our portfolio, we realized after some some analysis that we had done more than we thought on on biodiversity protection. So. Uh, if we if we actually look into the definition of biodiversity uh, enhancing activities in the taxonomy, we realize that restoration of, of ecosystems and pollution prevention uh, 
can be considered uh, biodiversity positive if we deal with legacy impacts. And that's that's what we've done for, for over 20 years. And the, the most paradigmatic example is the, is the work we've done in the, in the Baltic Sea uh, through the Northern Dimensional Environmental Partnership. So basically, um, this was a partnership mobilizing donor funds to blend with our own finance in, in support of uh, pollution prevention um, projects, particularly wastewater treatment plants around the Gulf of Finland. So after, in, after 20 years and investing 1.3 billion euros, we, had, we achieved a, a very significant um, environmental outcomes uh, that have been tracked by the Helsinki Conven Convention. Drops in phosphate, in nitrogen, uh, of 60, 20 percent respectively, that have very tangible, very tangible um, biodiversity and ecosystem positive impact. Right, the return of species like herrings, like uh, seals, like white eagles. So basically, a, a slow recovery of the of the Baltic ecosystem. And combining this experience with the with the work we've done, um, we've done with the with our partner and multilateral development banks, we came up with uh, with an action plan enshrined in the joint NDB statement um, on nature, people, and planet that we issued for the COP26 in Glasgow two years ago. That, that joint statement basically frames the action to scale up activities in biodiversity for, for NDBs and, uh, and is structured into five pillars. First pillar being leadership, showing leadership in, in, in biodiversity action, especially on our safeguards. The second pillar is scaling up nature finance because traditionally we've been investing between five and 10% of our ABI, our annual business volume in, um, in environmental investments, but we need to, we need to scale up that, that investment. Uh, again, it's a, it's, it's a complex topic because typically investments in biodiversity do not have very clear cash flows or revenue streams, right? So we've been thinking through how to expand the, the entry points and, on top of the traditional environmental protection and pollution prevention projects, uh, we thought about you know, scaling up our activities in nature resolution and also try to achieve net gains, net biodiversity gains in the application of our environmental social policy whenever it's possible as an opportunity, not as a, as a requirement. But what is clear is that we need to work on the creation of both a carbon removal markets to pay for reforestation efforts, for example, and in the long term, on biodiversity markets, just like the UK DEFRA, the Department of Agriculture, um, has been doing here in the in the in Great Britain. Um, so that's on a scaling up on a scale up nature financing, looking for additional entry points, but also creating markets to to compensate investors for for those positive initiatives. Right. The third pillar is the evaluation of 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 nature, and um, we've developed a uh, we've developed a natural capital valuation model. To, uh, to apply to our um, large projects, to category A projects, in order to start taking into consideration the value of the services that ecosystem provides around our projects, and therefore internalizing those, um, those ecosystem services in the decision making of, of our projects. Uh, the, the fourth pillar is better data and reporting, and that We've, we've initiated work with, uh, with our NDBs in order to standardize the data we gather um, through our environmental social due diligence, the biodiversity data we gather through our environmental social due diligence, and share it with the, um, with the global biodiversity um, initiative, with the global biodiversity information facility, in order to, uh, to provide feedback on, 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 the, on the data that we gather on our projects. As well, we've, uh, we've been the first uh, multilateral bank that, uh, that launched a TNFD pilot, a uh, pilot on the, on the methodology that the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures has put, put forward. Why? In order to, to properly assess nature-related risks, but also identify opportunities in our projects, right? And what we found out is that there's quite a lot of synergies between climate and nature-related risks. So we might, we might be able, we will be able to benefit from the work that we've done for, on climate. And the final point that I wanted to highlight, and, and I know we're uh, we're quite delayed and we're quite uh, tight on time, so I want to to be very brief. The the final pillar is that of creating regional synergies. And I, I mentioned before the Northern Dimension that the Northern Dimension Partnership was actually the basis on on which we uh, we tr we are trying to replicate the idea, the idea of a 
uh, marine ecosystem recovery now in the Mediterranean. And actually, together with our, with our friends of, from the Union for the Mediterranean, from the EIB, now with the French Development Agency and KFW as well, we have proposed and we have launched a Blue Mediterranean Partnership. That is a, um, a, um, a, a platform to actually bring together donors, recipient countries, and implementing agencies in order to promote and, and use blended finance uh, in order to promote uh, projects that will, will help recover the southern and eastern Mediterranean coastline, right? Um, and that, that Blue Mediterranean Partnership will be blended, will be, will be combined with policy reform in the different countries where we will operate in order to actually use those pilots as, as, as reference to, to, to upscale standards and, and best practices in the, in the protection of our, our, of our marine environment. So that's, that's all from my side that summarizes our, our experience and our action in scaling up biodiversity investments and, and activities. Over back to you, Patrick, and thanks again for the for the invitation to speak here. Thank you very much, Adonai, for for that perspective from EBID and uh, the information on the activities that, of the bank already, and also uh, as you indicated, the need uh, as you've identified the need to to scale up in the in the future to to achieve the um, to achieve the the targets that were adopted then last year. Um, so that uh, ends the presentations by stakeholders. Um, just to indicate, so from UNDP, um, Mr. Kishnan Kode wasn't able to participate, but he did send us a video, uh, a video from UNDP, which sets out the the works, uh, the work of UNDP and the, their priorities. Um, that we will then forward, we will distribute amongst, uh, along with the other PowerPoint presentations, so all participate participants can have a look at that. Um, as I said, that ends then the. The presentations that we have from the individual stakeholders. I think the the, the important thing to really emphasize is that um, the idea that these the stakeholders will play a, a very key role in implementation, working along obviously with national governments, which are in the first line uh, are responsible for achieving the objectives that they are, uh, agreed and adopted at uh, under the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, uh, just so, as I said, these the, the stakeholders will will complement the, the work will complement each other, hopefully. Uh, and uh, I think it's what's great to see is that there's already uh, significant engagement in the Mediterranean region by the various stakeholders, and that was very very uh, encouraging to see the work that's already there. Um, so I think it's a question of obviously it's a question of then implementing that in the in the in the years ahead. Um, from my side, I think before I pass the floor back to to Alessandra. Uh, I just have a couple of uh, closing remarks from from the EU, so from the EU co-presidency, co um, just to emphasize, which I think would take away from uh, from this event. Firstly, I think the, the, the fact that we've gone over time indicates the the extreme interest there is, uh, the, the, the amount of uh, issues to be discussed um, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of uh, protecting and restoring biodiversity in the Mediterranean region. Uh, we've identified also the threat uh, of this, the ongoing biodiversity crisis was exacerbated by the climate crisis, um, which is ex uh, particularly uh, strong um, and significant in the Mediterranean region. There are just three points I would like uh, to highlight as takeaways. The first one would be the importance of full and swift implementation uh, of all existing policies and stepping up national targets where necessary. So that's either as part of a revision of the MBSAPs, the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plans, or separately to that. The second one would be to uh, the importance of making full use of the tools and initiatives, both at regional and global level. And um, we've seen a number of those from the stakeholders in the last session. Um, and then, but finally, the point was to stress that the governments are, as I say, in the first instance, the key to the full implementation and they have a key steering role for implementa implementation domestically as well, which shouldn't be forgotten. And with that, uh, I would then pass the floor back to you, Alessandra, um, to close this webinar. Many thanks, Patrick. Uh, Patrick, and many thanks to everybody, really, for um, this um, really important contribution to, uh, to the webinar itself, to these exchanges 
regional exchanges that we are having. You, of course, uh, uh, stress the importance of uh, countries' uh, follow-up, of course, to the COP15 decision. We, as uh, UFM, will continue, actually, to pull uh, resources. It proves to be uh, very important that the region, as one, keeps on collaborating along these lines. Is of course an element of uh, support uh, to the national endeavors uh, themselves, but also indeed uh, to reach in the uh, international uh, agreements. As we said, it's a pooling of resources, exchanges of practices, as well as um, a continuous basically uh, feeding uh, each other's mind on, uh, um, you know, um, achieving. Uh, um, and uh, getting on a common path towards these, uh, let's say, new challenge, uh, in particular also the race against the time uh, that we have also to the uh, climate change uh, pressure that is specifically affecting the Mediterranean region being one, uh, being the second, you know, uh, region in the world, uh, warming, let's say, faster, 20% faster than others. So with this, I uh, will close. Thank you very much. Uh, the PPTs will be distributed. As you mentioned, Patrick, it's a pity that we cannot show the uh, presentation from UNDP. And indeed, uh, they related the let's say, specificity of the Biofin uh, initiative, but uh, all the material is there. And we look forward actually to meet you at the very next uh, occasion and meetings. Thank you so much and have a very good day. Bye.